monthly webinar series. Today we have a very exciting topic. It's 15 years of employee engagement surveys. Why is engagement not improving? And what can you do in your organization? So um, this is, sounds like a very loaded topic and we're very excited to talk about it here today. Uh, my name is Kelly Rigoli and I'm a marketing coordinator here at Talent Map. And as you know, Norm uh, Bailey David is our Senior Vice President of Consulting here at Talent Map, and he'll be leading the helm on this webinar and sharing some insights on this topic. I'm also extremely excited to introduce our wonderful guest panelist, Ruth Wright, who will be uh, bringing her wealth of experience as well here today. Ruth is the Director of Strategic Human Resources Management Research within the Organizational Performance Division of the Conference Board of Canada. Ruth brings to this position over 25 years of experience in work, workforce research. She has authored numerous reports and briefings in the areas of human resources management, measurement and analytics, culture and change, diversity and inclusive talent management strategies, as well as employee engagement. And just to cover our agenda today, we'll be primarily focusing on the Conference Board of Canada's research, uh, what drives engagement, workplace factors of engagement, uh, and then of course, why hasn't engagement improved? And how your organization can buck that trend and, and can change that. A little bit about Talent Map. Uh, we have been in business for over 15 years. We have performed 7,000 plus in employee engagement surveys since inception. And so therefore, over a million employees have been surveyed with our company. And then 500 plus employee engagement surveys happen annually. And of course, our only one primary focus being uh, employee engagement itself. So as you can see here, here's a sample of our clients and our benchmarks. Uh, we work with numerous uh, different kinds of clients. We have a large focus in health and sciences and financial services, and also non-for-profit and associations. Without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Ruth Wright. She'll be sharing some info about the Conference Board of Canada. Over to you, Ruth. Thank you, Kelly and uh, Norm. It's such a pleasure to be talking to the Talent Map Universe about our project. For those of you who don't know the Conference Board, we're a long live, not-for-profit research organization. We are headquartered in Ottawa, but we are not government. We are independent, and our mission is to build a better future for Canadians by making our economy and society more dynamic and competitive. And we do that essentially by providing research and other services to business and key stakeholders of the business world in uh, three key areas, economic forecasting, public policy, and organizational performance, which is, is the area that I'm primarily involved with. So, a little bit of context. Um, how did our partnership with Talent Map come about, first of all? A few years ago, we started conversations with uh, Sean Fitzpatrick and the Talent Map team about how we could team up. We really appreciated Talent Map's commitment to education, and of course, they have a great database after these years of, uh, of conducting surveys. And of course, we at the conference board have the data hounds. Hence, our study on employee engagement, which was published um, a little over a year ago, I guess, called Leveraging the Science to Inspire Great Performance. And uh, that could be found on our e-library. In terms of the context, a concern that I've had for some time is that organizations are collectively investing hundreds of millions of dollars in the survey process and may not necessarily be optimizing their investment. And in many cases, we see project managers inheriting old instruments. They may not understand the science uh, in terms of what engagement is, what drives it, what are the behaviors that they're trying to drive in the workforce, and in turn, how that's going to affect organizational performance. You know, it's essentially an input-output model, but it has a tendency to get jumbled. And I'm not sure that there's a really good understanding about the connection between an engaged workforce and that typically long questionnaire that we tend to use to measure it. And then uh, there's a question of what we do with the results. 
So we provide a little third-party analysis and education. And, um, you know, once you've conducted that survey and you identify where your key engagement cha challenges are, you know, I think there's a question for organizations about how to respond. What are the really great practices that can boost engagement and what can we do to create great employee experiences? Uh, we need to provide better support for our leaders and managers, I think, because as we're going to see, they play a really important role. And I also think it behooves organizations and those charged with managing the employee engagement process to be able to evaluate their vendors and their survey instruments and, you know, understand why we're asking these specific questions you know, and, and, and what do the responses mean? So in terms of our methodology and our research, um, a bit about that, the, the study began with mining 10 years of the data from uh, the talent map benchmark to look at longitudinal ten trends, of course, at the same time uh, conducting a, a literature review, pretty exhaustive, around employee engagement and all its antecedents. We developed an independent model of engagement and a prototype survey, and we put that in the field and collected a valid sample. And then we used factor analysis to boil engagement down to what we call the seven key factors that influence engagement. And then once we had that, we all went back to the talent map sample and identified eight organizations who were really good performers. Either they'd had sustained high engagement over a period of time or they've been able to boost their engagement. And we asked them to share their great practices um, that related to these factors that we identified. So what did we find? Um, in terms of some longitudinal trends, one of the things uh, we did was we looked at the scores between 2005 and 2014. So that's what you see on this chart. And, and you can see that um, in, the, in the early years, 2005 um, up to eight, there was a pretty steady climb in engagement scores. And that was during a relatively prosperous time in the economy. And then we see this dip during that recessionary period of 2008, 2009. We, we have a bit of recovery in Canada, so you see a, a spike upwards around 2010. It always lags the economy a little bit, um, but there's, you can see that there is this link to the performance of the economy and engagement. But then we see from 2010 to 2014 that the scores have more or less plateaued and there's a slight downward trajectory there. Um, the economy was kind of muddling around, but it, you know, it was improving a little bit from, from year to year, but employee engagement really didn't. So why is this? You know, it, have we picked off the low-hanging fruit? And so this is what Norm's going to tackle in a moment. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in Norm's observations on this. So I just wanted to talk about some of the data from our own sample. And I think the major point here on this is that, well, first of all, our sample weren't highly engaged. Only 27% of them were highly engaged. And if you're looking at that engagement, that's the black horizontal line across the chart. Um, but, you know, we have a tendency when we get engagement scores back just to look at the overall score. I think the point of this slide is that there are actually huge differences by demographics, by age, by tenure, level in the organization, the kind of work that people do, the different job families, and even different industry sectors. So if we look at this, you know, who's engaged and who isn't? And you can see on the left we have those that are most engaged. So those are the ones that are well above the 27% highly engaged line. Um, and the least engaged, of course, on the right, below that, that line. So we see, not a surprise, the most engaged are senior executives and brand new employees with less than one year tenure um, in terms of industry sectors and not-for-profit organizations. So you, tend to, you may sacrifice a little in pay over your career, but tend to ha be more engaged. Um, the least engaged um, industry sector, federal government, 
And we also see, you know, that pretty high engagement in really small organizations, which isn't a surprise because there's high touch. Uh, in terms of the least engaged, I think um, important here, um, in terms of tenure, those people in that 20 to 25 year age range, likely people that aren't in management and, and obviously executive categories, if there's low engagement in that pocket, low engagement um, with the clerical support, and a big red flag for us was the low engagement on technical professionals and um, technical and, and skilled trades folks. This, this is a group that's not highly engaged. Okay, if, if we move on, uh, we'll talk about uh, the drivers of engagement. I'm going to show our model. You remember I mentioned that we distilled um, uh, everything down into seven key factors that drive engagement or influence engagement. And I'm going to walk you through this, spend quite a bit of time on this. The first and most influential area has to do with the confidence that employees have in their senior leaders. So that's in, you know, I'm, I'm working from the lower left hand uh, side of, of the screen that you're looking at. And so what does this encompass, this notion of confidence in, in, in senior leaders? Uh, there are a number of things here. Um, it's that perception of employees that senior leaders can achieve goals that they put forth a compelling vision for the organization. Uh, they set ambitious but realistic goals. And, and this is a really interesting one because this on this item, it got the absolute lowest rating in our prototype survey. So we can see some, some concerns here around perception of senior leaders. Um, senior leaders clearly communicate objectives, um, you know, ob really critical, they're the linchpin and the enabler for many of the other factors related to engagement. Trust in senior leaders, really critical. Trust, um, this is the one that has the highest correlation to overall engagement. And this was low too, the, the third lowest in the survey in fact. Um, senior leaders follow through with commitments. And, and again, this follow through with commitment is important for a couple reasons because it does drive trust. And also, it's related to this sense of progression. What's really important for employees is this perception that we're moving forward, that we're, we're, we're pursuing the goals and, and uh, personal and, and organizational and, and making some progress. So that, that's the confidence in senior leadership factor. The next um, critical factor is relationship with the manager. And of course, this is going to be quite familiar with folks, um, we, we see this a lot in the literature. You know, it's things around, uh, my manager again follows through with commitments related to trust. My manager values my opinions and ideas, so if people feel like they're having a genuine effect on organizational outcomes. Uh, my manager provides constructive feedback. You know, employees wanna know how they're performing. However, they don't want to be punished, so, um, constructive is the oper operative word here. Feedback's meant to help people develop their knowledge and skills and progress in the organization. And finally, on this uh, factor, my manager includes me in decisions that affect my work. So having some measure of control is, is really important for individuals. The thing I wanna note about the, the relationship with manager factor relative to the senior leadership one is that the, the manager, these manager factors were rated um, much more highly than the leadership factors. So um, organizations are, are doing relatively better on this. I think that uh, managers have been the target and organizations have been doing a lot of work on this. So the next one, uh, professional and personal growth. Employees feel that their career goals can be achieved with their organization and that they can see a clear career path for themselves in the organization. There's a, uh, in the next one, acknowledgement and recognition. Um, this sense that my work and, and me, I'm not taken for granted and that my work contributions are recognized and you know that it's somewhat proactive uh, 
it, it, acknowledging and recognizing employees helps foster engagement. And, and we've seen, you know, instant jolts in, in employee engagement in organizations that use things like, um, you know, online recognition tools where you kind of democratize that whole engagement piece and, and, and really foster that uh, esprit de corps. Um, uh, the next factor, um, strong relationships with coworkers. Um, strong teamwork and information sharing are really key in this one. You know, people work like they're part of a team and um, people share information willingly. The final factor here is aut autonomy. And the key items here are, again, about control. Control over how work gets done and having some say in the setting of performance objectives would be typical items that would fall under that. So when we take all of these seven factors combined, um, we found that this represented close to 80% of what comprises employee engagement in an organization. You know, there are lots of factors that drive engagement. You can talk about innovation, pay, benefits, corporate social responsibility, um, they're less influential or they, they're kind of subsumed under these in a way. So it's our contention that if you really pay attention to these, you're going to have a significant impact on your engagement. And um, there are also items that if, if you're doing a bit of a, a checklist on your surveys that you want to see that your in instrument is measuring how you're doing on some of these key things. Um, I'll speak for a minute on the, um, uh, a little bit about the construction of a typical survey. And this is where it gets a bit complicated. Surveys typically have two or three components. There's the one component where you're met, you have a, a lot of questions that are measuring these various um, factors that influence engagement. So there's a lot of sub items under each of those factors. That takes up a lot of the space in a questionnaire. And then there's usually six or eight questions that directly measure facets of engagement because there's different kinds of engagement. It's such a multi-dimensional construct. And um, often when you'll see an, uh, an engagement score, it might be based off of these six questions. But you need to know about these other characteristics to do the work in terms of responding uh, to employee concerns. So, so we've got four uh, direct engagement questions here in our prototype. Willingness to recommend, um, you can see that in the, the dark blue banners across the top of this chart. I'm proud to work for the organization. I derive a sense of personal accomplishment and at the moment I do not plan on leaving the organization. So you can see that they're all kind of different dimensions of engagement. And what's interesting here is if you look underneath, we, we put um, the top three uh, drivers for, for each measure of engagement. And what you'll see is that um, uh, for the, uh, uh, the drivers related to willingness to recommend the organization and pride, it's all about senior leadership, trust in senior leaders, confidence that they'll achieve the goal, follow through on commitment. Then if you look at um, the engagement uh, uh, related to sense of personal accomplishment and retention, I do not plan on leaving the organization. Those are all about the drivers related to the work, particularly in terms of my sense of personal accomplishment, it's about the work. And then retention is really about them seeing uh, a clear career path for themselves in the organization, that there's a fit, that I like the work, and I can see a future for, here for me. So I think the important thing here is that what makes people proud and willing to recommend an organization, not necessarily what keeps them from leaving, which is the pro professional growth opportunities. So um, you can ask yourself, in, in responding to a, a, your survey questionnaire, what behaviors are you really trying to drive? For instance, do you have uh, a retention issue with a key job family like your IT folks? Well, then maybe you're really going to want to pay attention to things around 
uh, the work and career pathing, for instance. We'll go on to the, the last slide I have here, Norm. Um, and this relates to the uh, overall strength of the engagement factors. As I said when I was running through these seven factors, and you can see that's what they are listed at the bottom. The measure here is the relative strength of the engagement factor within the model. But what you can see is that confidence in senior leadership and relationship with the manager together um, explain close to 40% of the model. Um, interesting, challenging work is, is pretty close to as important as the relationship with the manager. Then we have the, these other items, professional and personal growth. And uh, you know, all of these are important, just that there are some relative importance. And when you're thinking about the things you want to work on, you want to think about your organizational context. And um, you know, if, if you compress on these levers with your employment practices, you'll drive engagement. And you know, you really don't need a survey to do that. But what you do need the survey for is to understand what employees' perceptions are around these drivers. And then when you've got that information, you can go to work. And you know, we have finite resources for um, you know, programs and practices that we're going to use. So um, you can make some decisions about where you want to focus. So Norm, this leaves us with the question, why aren't our people practices enhancing engagement? So over to you. Why is engagement not improving? I mean, one of the things that uh, most is, is most astounding, and Ruth, you mentioned it a little bit before, the amount of dollars that's spent in terms of conducting surveys, doing action plans, marshalling resources around this concept of employee engagement. In North America, recent stats point out that's over 720 million US dollars, uh, North, which you know, Canadian and American combined. And this is all we get, I mean, six points of engagement in, uh, you know, over the course of more than 10 years. So you know, what's going on here? What, what do we need to do differently? So, before I get into that, we also have to take stock of what's going right. What is working well? And I think the first thing that we can see, and a big change, those of you who've been around a while, uh, certainly that would include myself, uh, around 10, 15 years ago, the concept of, engage, of, of the term employee engagement, the concept of engagement was relatively new. And one of the things that we've been able to see is if you just look, you track the Google searches on that term, employee engagement, you can see that it has now become a large part of the lexicon. Since 2004, you've got basically zero searches on the term of employee engagement, and that's, you know, that's basically up uh, you know, several fold uh, since in, the, in, in those 11 or 12 years. So the awareness, at least organizations, management teams, HR teams, executive teams, are cognizant of this concept called employee engagement. So that's a start, but it took a long time for that to happen. One of the good things that we've seen uh, come out of this is a very different approach to career progression. And of course, when we look at some of the, those four factors, or at least well, four of the seven factors, uh, we'll talk about the management and the leadership factors in a second, but when we talk about the professional growth factor, one of the, the, the changes that we've noticed, and this was done, uh, a particular study was done by Deloitte, in terms of the changing uh, approach to career, uh, the perception of how a career develops and the changing approach to doing that. And what we've seen is rather than a ladder progression and the expectation that someone would join the organization and follow more or less a step ladder approach to becoming a, man, a supervisor, then a manager, then a director, then a vice president, that's gone. Uh, and organizations, for a lot of reasons, don't follow that model anymore, but neither do employees. Uh, and you can see the lattice pathways on the right-hand side. It's a very, very different approach to career development, and that's fundamentally stirred by a couple of factors. The first is the entrance of the millennials into the market, who are very quick to say, if I'm not going to get something meaningful, interesting, and grow my career, I'm out of here. I'm leaving. I'm going somewhere else. I might even be going back to my parents' basement. Um, you know, and that's forced organizations to take a little bit of a different view. Now, of course, we were seeing it only 
in the most recent years, but we're seeing a fundamental trend in terms of how careers are development and now more recently in terms of how performance is managed from the annual performance appraisal form to a much more regular future oriented career pathing type of conversation. But that's only in its infancy and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. What do the organizations that we survey and that we're also the leaders in terms of uh, the database that, that Conference Board looked at, what are they doing right? What are those stars doing best? And time after time after time, what the stars are doing best, those folks that are in the top 10 percentage points of employee engagement. Now, you saw, you know, the, the, the number of, that are highly engaged is very low. The average engagement is around 53. The, the stars are in the high 80s and sometimes 90s for smaller organizations. What are they doing well? What they're doing well is they're focusing on those key drivers. They're putting their efforts, their resources, their time and their measurement into what's important to engagement as opposed to what's going wrong. And I think that's the fundamental difference. So if you look at what organizations aren't doing well, what they're not doing well is they're, they're working on the wrong things. So they're only working on half of the problem or the solution. So let me show you a typical, very typical uh, sort of results Set. We show this slide in our employee engagement surveys. Clients of ours will recognize this, where we look at all of the different dimensions of engagement, not just the ones that are drivers, not just those seven, but you can see pretty much everything that has some influence on engagement that's been shown over the years and research is measured. And what we're looking for here is not necessarily the importance. What we're looking for in this particular measurement is how employees perceive the different dimensions. And you, this is an example for one particular organization, but what I want to do is really illustrate that typically when I do a presentation, the management team is going to immediately jump on the bottom of the run. I'm not even finished presenting what's on the top, and already I'm going to get questions fired around me. How can we improve communications? Why are people, people so, so caught up in compensation? Uh, the, the answers to that should be obvious. But rather than understand and focus on what it is that drives engagement, the things that we saw in the research, like leadership, like management, like interesting and challenging work, like professional growth, like recognition, even if those things are, 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 are we can see in this particular organization, immediate management senior leadership are quite well regarded, uh, you know, above benchmark for this particular organization. Yet, the organization's focusing all of their efforts on the bottom. And so what happens is they're spinning their wheels. And when an organization spins its wheels, you get the results in terms of that flat line or relatively flat line that we saw afterwards. And then you also get a phenomenon well, where employees are frustrated because while the organization, if it's done anything at all, it's focused on the wrong thing and they're still not um, getting redress on things that are really important to them, like leadership and management then it doesn't really matter you know, how they perceive those. If they're not getting the redress and the improvement on those, their engagement is going to stall. And that's essentially what's going on here. Another interesting thing is really a generational, uh, a generational phenomenon. Some of you may be old enough or experienced enough to have been around uh, in the 1980s. And one of the things we saw in business school in the 1980s was this book called What, what Color Is Your Parachute? And in that book, 23% in the 1980s, when it first came out, uh, ex you know, people expected meaningful work. That number now, in the 2014 edition, is up to 67%. Two-thirds of people looking for a job now expect meaningful work. That's more than triple than it has before. And we see that. We saw that in, in terms of the results that, that Ruth, you pointed out before. Um, you know, interesting, challenging, meaningful work is much more important to engaging the individual than it used to be. And then when we look at our own surveys, we see, especially in the millennial group, uh, folks that understand or think that their work is presently challenging, about two-thirds, 65%. And you know what? We would say at first glance, that's pretty good. You know, not too bad. Two thirds are, are finding their work challenging. We don't have an issue. But when we look and compare that to the generation above, so those age 35 and over, that number is 77%, more than three quarters. There's a 12 percentage gap there. 
a, a huge gap in terms of the percentage of that new generation coming into the marketplace that's not feeling that their work is meaningful and challenging. And of course, given what we saw before, that's going to have a detrimental impact on engagement. If we're not providing, especially our millennials, but not only uh, interesting, challenging work, how can we expect them to engage? And of course, that's one another reason why we're flatlining on in terms of, in terms of engagement. So what I want to do for the rest of the, the, the time, the, the little time that we have here is show you very, very quickly some of the solutions, some of the things that the best organizations are doing around those key drivers, around the things that are most important. I, and the first is what we call career management versus performance management. And I alluded to that in the Deloitte slide before. One of the key differences between the organizations that are getting engagement results in the 50s versus the ones that are getting engagement results at the 80s is the ones that are doing it in the 50s usually have the standard annual performance appraisal process where we convene a conversation that's very arduous. We look at strengths, we look at weaknesses, we look at what things have done wrong, have we met expectations, and we provide or usually provide some sort of numerical or rating compared to expectations. But that's completely missing the mark uh, in terms of what's needed. Career management addresses that by focusing the conversation to a future aspirational conversation. It still encompasses performance because it looks at, it asks the employee, where do you want to be in two, three years? How can we help you get there? Oh, and by the way, you haven't demonstrated this particular competency yet, so you really need to work on that to get to the next level. You're addressing the same issue that you did in the performance appraisal. But rather than having a conversation that's negative, that you didn't do this, and that's why we're not going to give you a raise, it's this is what you need to do to get to the next level. And especially what's happening is millennials are driving these future career pathing conversations. But where we see the gap happening is that managers aren't trained. Managers mostly in the Gen X and baby boomer generations are just not trained and equipped to handle these types of conversations and they avoid them like the plague so what we have to do is we have to instill models we have to instill processes in our organization that's going to facilitate these conversations by training our managers and by holding them accountable for having these conversations but by having the employee initiate those conversations because they're the really they're the ones that want to hear that ongoing career pathing, future-oriented feedback. And then we get the question of leadership. So I apologize if I'm rushing through this a little bit. I do want to respect our time. So leadership and management, by far the two most important conditions to having an engaged or, or an engaged workforce. And we see that very, very clearly. I can walk in to a senior leadership presentation and within the course of a half an hour of my presentation, I can get a good feel for the leadership and their approach to management and leading and vision and understand fundamentally why the organization is where it is in terms of its level of engagement. And sometimes, uh, you know, it's, it's, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not, but it's the leadership that's making a lot of the difference. So what are those practices that engage? Ruth mentioned it before. Uh, it's fundamentally about trust and honest communication. Um, the secret sauce is really, really easy to understand. It's around transparency, and especially I'm sitting here in Vancouver as we speak, and our neighbors to the east, Alberta, difficult times. Um, the organizations that are excelling in terms of keeping their employees engaged, even improving the engagement in those difficult times, are ones that treat employees as partners. Not partners in an equity or ownership sense, but partners in an information sense. They're transparent. They say, this is what we expect. This is what's going to happen. This is the best that we can do. This is as much as we can tell you. They're frequent. They're forthright. They're answering employee questions. They're admitting when they don't know. They're taking ownership of that agenda. Their people priorities are clearly embedded in what they want to do. It's not HR strategy. And I think that's really, really key. And then you have something that's very, very practical. And that's the last point here. Talent is more built than boss. In other words, 
when employees see external hiring and no explanation for why those people are, need to come in and they're being passed over for the few promotions that do exist, then they're going to obviously feel that they've been slighted. And they're going to take a hit in terms of some of those key engagement drivers, leadership trust, relationship with manager, professional growth. But when we see there's a concerted effort to look for talent internally first, and then go outside when we can't find that talent internally and explain to employees in a transparent manner why we're doing that, then we have a much more honest, open relationship with the employees that they value. And because they value it, they engage. Really the biggest difference though, uh, and this is as much due uh, uh, results of our surveys as, as it is anecdotal. And one of the things that I repeat over and over and over again to leadership teams is the style and the way you need to lead and manage is different. No longer is the good leader somebody who gets the report done on time, who presents the best strategic plan to the board. Those, that, that's, those behaviors are valued by other leaders, but they're not necessarily valued by employees. Connection is valued by employees. And those leadership teams that effectively connect with their employees are the ones that are going to be uh, held in higher esteem, higher regard, there's going to be better trust. Uh, and none of this is taking away from what leaders need to do, which is provide an inspiring vision for the organization and manage towards that vision. But the difference here is effectively connecting, I would say, more than communicating with employees. And that can be as much as, you know, a, you know, a, a town hall meeting with employees to allow for some dialogue, some direct connection throughout the hierarchy, but more importantly, it's those little things. It's sitting down with a group of employees impromptu in the cafeteria. It's saying, hi, how are your kids in the elevator? Yes, things like that, little things, are connecting with employees and humanizing the leadership team. And when we do that, the employee fundamentally understands that these are human beings that have our best interests at heart. And it's the demonstration of empathy but by the leaders towards the employees that's really, really key here. And it's presence, visibility, and approachability. Those three words are the fundamental differences between a leadership team that's held in high regard and therefore engages its employees versus those who are not. It's, it's clear as day. When we see that the leadership is not contributing to engagement, it's because they're quote-unquote not approachable. It's because we, quote, unquote, we never see them. It's because, we, I quote, unquote, they don't understand what we're going through. And when you can see those differences, and the way to remedy that is get your leaders out there. Get them talking to employees. Get them managing by walking around. Get them on video. Get them to blog. That's, what, that's basically what has to happen here. And then on the management side, essentially what the best managers can do better here, um, essentially, you know, I've got... A, a lot of this is, is pretty basic stuff. It's pretty obvious stuff. And, but what we need to do is we need to understand and coach the managers in the differences between their behaviors and, and, and coaching them to model the desirable behaviors and, of course, avoid the undesirable behaviors. If you ask any single manager, of course, they're going to tell you, I only do the stuff on the left. Uh, the engagement survey will actually point out when managers are engaging in those undesirable behaviors. I mean, just quickly looking at them, setting clear goals, leading by example, trust. Trust, again, trusting staff with tasks as opposed to expecting staff to learn by doing uh, and it's expecting that the manager can do always better job than the staff can do. I won't go through all this. You'll be able to see it in the, in the final presentation. And a lot of this stuff, I think, comes, it's pretty much second nature, but it's not a question of knowing about it, it's a question of being able to coach our managers to take accountability for enacting and exhibiting these desirable behaviors and eradicating the undesirable behaviors. But there's one real perception that's above all of us that really influences how a manager is different. And that's where we see the caring manager. So just as we saw the visible or approachable leader is the difference between having an engaged organization and a disengaged one, the same thing as caring about and exhibiting caring about the individuals that work for them. And you just have to look at the data. Engagement for those organizations who believe that their manager cares about me as a person, or at least seems to, is 
The engagement among those individuals who don't believe that's true is only 55%. That's over 100,000 people. So we're pretty rock solid in terms of the difference there, and it's pretty it's pretty clear. So some caring about individuals is not something you necessarily you can tell somebody to do, but you can coach them in terms of its importance. And oftentimes it's the demonstration of that caring that a lot of managers don't feel is that important. And we can show them with this slide that it's crucial. So to, to summarize, why is engagement not important? improving is because most organizations are focusing on the wrong things. We're focusing on what employees feel worst about as opposed to what's important to engagement. We're focusing on things like communications and silos and the fact that people feel aggrieved about their compensation and, uh, and those things that temp typically come at the bottom of our, uh, of our lists in terms of understanding you know, where our organizations perceive. The best in class organizations are focusing on what's important. Those drivers of engagement that Ruth and the research clearly pointed out are more important. Leadership, management, having meaningful work, and professional growth. I gave you some quick tips and tricks in terms of some of the practices that some of those organizations are doing to do that. Obviously, there's more to be said and more to be had, but fundamentally, if you focus on your engagement drivers, if you understand what's important in your organization, in most organizations, we know what those are, um, but you know, conducting that survey, looking at your survey, and, and focusing on what's driving engagement as opposed to just what's quote unquote wrong, you'll be able to buck the trend. So on that note, I will uh, pass it back to Kelly, uh, and I will look at the questions to see if we can answer one or two questions before we have to sign off at the top of the hour. Kelly? Thanks, Norm. Um, great, so that was very informative. Thank you so much to Norm and Ruth. Uh, so I'm just going to cover some of our learning sessions that we have coming up for Talent Map. So um, in, next week, we're going to be in Edmonton, and we're going to be attending the Human Resources Institute for Alberta, the HRIA annual conference. Um, President of Talent Map, Sean Fitzpatrick, is going to be speaking on next level engagement, employee experience. And then the week after that, we're going to be in Vancouver, uh, where Norm is right now. So we're going to be speaking at the HRMA, which is actually called CP, uh, HRBC, and UConn now. And we'll be speaking on from employee engagement to employee experience as well. And then May 10th, we're going to have the uh, OMA conference, which is a spring conference. We also have a fall one as well, and it's the Ontario Municipal Administrators Association. And uh, Norm is going to be speaking on employee engagement in municipalities, a special sector requiring a very special approach. And then we're going to have next month our next talent map webinar, which is going to be on absenteeism, presenteeism, and employee engagement. And that will be on May 18th, again, noon Eastern time. And then we're going to be uh, following up in June, starting our summer off in New York. Again, we're going to Verona uh, to the New York Tech Summit. So that's going to be very exciting. Norm, do you have any questions there? Yeah, I saw one uh, referring to, which I believe is the senior leadership slide. So I'll flip back to that. And the question was around how do we get senior leaders to take accountability for that engagement? Of course, that's the quintessential problem. Uh, but the way we do that is essentially we build on the fundamental need to engage our employees. And by what we do is we build the business case for engagement. Now, one of the things that I haven't gone through today is really the, the, the empirical model that shows how employee engagement affects business results. And we show them that. And we show them that higher employee engagement has been a result in key business outcomes, such as higher productivity. If you're a publicly traded organization, it's going to be a better stock price. Um, and this is all empirical research that links directly high engagement to uh, to those you know to those those business outcomes. So once you establish that yes, we want those good business outcomes, higher engagement is a way to get us there. And if we see that leadership is preventing us, the perceptions of leadership are one of the obstacles to achieving that higher level of engagement then we can then have a conversation with leaders to say, okay, what is it we need to change? Because we want to fundamentally engage our employees to achieve those business outcomes. So it's really a connect the dots type of exercise. So that's the question that I have. On that note, we have our, we're just a little bit past the hour, so I'm going to take this opportunity to adjourn. Uh, before I do that, I'm just going to show you a last slide. 
that on this last slide, uh, there will be a link both to Ruth and my email if you have any further questions. And there's also a link to the conference board report uh, that you can purchase, um, and, and that will be on the presentation as well. So, so thank you. On that note, folks, uh, for those of you here in the West, have a great rest of your day. Of course, for those of you in the East, have a great afternoon. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Have a good day.